Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Ben. I'm from Physics Education, uh, and welcome to our Maths Made Real webinar for this afternoon. Uh, I'm not alone, though. I'm joined by uh, my friend Jackie. Jackie, do you want to say hi? Hi, everyone. Not. Hi, everyone. This is Jackie <laughs> coming to you from Melbourne today. Unreal. Well, um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Now, you might have noticed you can't see Jackie and you also can't see each other. And that's because we're using the kind of secure webinar format for this afternoon's session. Um, just because we can't see you, though, doesn't mean that you can't interact with us. So uh, there's a few different ways to do that. The first way is down the bottom there, there's a little button called Q&A. Uh, if you open that up, a little dialogue box will open and you can type in any questions you've got. Maybe something that I said that you want a bit more information on or another kind of mathsy question that pops into your head. Um, please ask them in there and Jackie might answer them uh, by typing out an answer or she might pass them over to me and we'll answer them live. So please use that Q&A function to ask questions. Um, uh, but that's how you ask us stuff. We've also got a way to ask you stuff. Uh, so um, Zoom allows us to use a function called polls, which is where we ask you a question and you answer it. Uh, so we're going to use a, a poll right now, a little test poll um, to... Uh, to test that little functional uh, functionality out. Uh, so let's throw that one up. Hi, Ben. We don't have that poll. Um, oh. I'm sorry. Well, you'll get to find out real soon because in like 30 seconds, we'll be running one. Oh, unreal. Well, too easy then. So friends, um, the polls will come up and they'll be like a multiple choice uh, question. So you click the answer that you think is the right one or the one that you think uh, or the one that applies to you, and then hit submit. And we'll collect all the results. That'll give us an idea of what you were thinking um, and kind of how your uh, your kind of maths brains are working this afternoon. So um, the whole idea of this afternoon session is to kind of explore um, the way that maths kind of like leaves the classroom and affects our lives in, in um, lots of different ways, and particularly in ways that you wouldn't expect. I mean, you know, there are my dad, for example, he's an accountant and I kind of get that he's going to have to use maths every day. That makes sense. But there are lots of different ways that maths impacts our lives that you might not expect. So um, without further ado, we are going to uh, have a very quick whirlwind tour of the activity that I think is about as far away from doing maths in a classroom as you could. And that is going on holiday. See, I have been stuck at home for ages. You guys would understand this as well, the, um, the COVID-19 restrictions. So the very first thing I want to do when, uh, when borders are reopened is go on a holiday. And Jackie's been working hard too. So we're both going to go. We're going to skip town and I think we're going to head over to New York. Uh, I've always wanted to go there. So uh, as soon as everything's uh, freed up, we're going to go. So we're going to get prepared. So the first thing I want to do is, uh, is go to the travel agent, get them to help me out. So I go into the travel agent, right? And I can already see uh, on the window there, two deals uh, for flights to New York. 40% uh, off and buy one, get one free. Huh. Well, which one should I choose? Well, let's put a poll up. What do you think? Um, just give me a, using that little bit of information, which one do you think is the better deal? 40% off or buy one, get one free? Hmm. So friends, if the poll hasn't popped up, you might not be using the Zoom app. You might be going through your browser, whether that's Chrome or Firefox, uh, maybe it's Safari or, or Edge. Um, if you can't find the polls, you can always download the Zoom app uh, while this meeting's up, uh, and then you'll be able to participate in the poll sections uh, as they come up later. So, uh, okay, we've got about 70% um, oh, of people think buy one, get one free, and, and the other people think 40% off. Well. That's a pretty quick estimate we've had to make, right? Uh, let's end that poll. Um, so it's a pretty quick little estimate. So, uh, so you know, without having my calculator on hand, um, you know, we all have to make a very quick guess using the kind of internal maths of our brain to work out which one will be the best deal. All right, so I booked my flights. Next step is to get my accommodation. So I'll look up online and I found these two rooms and you can see the room on the left and the room on the right look very different in terms of what you get for your money but they also look different in terms of price so the room one looks pretty bare looks pretty spartan that's 15 dollars a night though that's pretty cheap um, and the second room looks a lot more lavish um, but it costs a lot more too so which room is should i get um let's throw another poll up um so which room should i choose room one on the left or room two on the right um what do you think? 
And guys, if your poll window is in the way of any of the content, you can actually click and drag it and move it out of the way um, if you need mm -hmm. to look at what's underneath. And Ben, it looks like most of us would, uh, would choose room two. About 92% of us have okay. said room two. Well, look, I will say that's very easy for say, to say for um, grade five, six, sevens, and eights, you probably won't be paying. Um, but yeah, so you've made an estimation of whether or not the room on the right is worth it, you know? Um, how much do you reckon that food costs every day? How much would you pay for actual mattresses on the bed? But the few people that did say room one, they might have thought to themselves, well, look, if I get home late and I leave early, I'm not really in my room very much. If I've got that extra $255 every day to go and do fun stuff, maybe that's worth it. Um, all right, uh, let's move on. So I've booked my accommodation and it's time to catch my flight. So I go to my Uber and I'm going to the airport and the Uber driver says we should get there at about 6.25 p.m. But my ticket says the flight leaves at 19.45. 19.45? Oh, that's that 24-hour time. Okay. Um, well, let's do a quick estimation. Am I going to have time to have dinner at the airport? Um, let's throw that poll up too. So do you think if I have to be at the airport at 6.25, but my flight leaves at 19.45, am I going to have time for dinner in between? What do you think? Well, it looks like so far... Most people reckon, yes. A couple of people reckon, oh, I'm not sure. And a couple of people reckon, no way. But, but so far, about 80% of people reckon, oh, 70% mm -hmm. people are changing the answers. So that's all right. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, about 70% of us saying, yes, we totally have time. So doing a little bit of conversion, you might have worked out that 1945 is a quarter to eight. So that's about an hour and 20 minutes after I get to the airport. Now, but then I've got to get to the terminal a certain amount before, but is that extra because it's an international flight? And, and how long will it take to get food anyway? You can see there's a lot of little calculations, a lot of little estimations that have to take place. Um, let's go to the next slide. So I've gone to New York, I've landed. Um, I'm gonna pull my little pen out, which I can do like this. Uh, so I, I get off my plane and I go on the train. I get to Grand Central Station in New York, which is this little section here. And I know my accommodation from my map is up here. Okay, so can I walk that? Or do I need to catch a taxi? Or do I need to catch another train? Or do I have to fly there? I mean, I guess I'm gonna to have to use this little scale down here. So kind of that idea of changing measurements for scale comes in really handy too. It's also the idea, guys, that when you're overseas, you have to pay a lot extra for data on your phone to roam, and I don't wanna pay that. So I don't have my GPS handy. That means I'm gonna to have to look at this map and then look at the real world and translate those small two-dimensional images on the map and kind of put them on top of the three-dimensional uh, kind of world that I'm looking at. So is this the right place? You know, if I look over at those buildings, how many blocks back from the park am I? Uh, you know, am I, is the shape of this block the same shape of the block of the, where my accommodation is? You can see we haven't even started the fun bit of the holiday. We've just got our flights, got the accommodation, got on the plane, landed and got the accommodation and we've already done basically nothing but math. Um, and I guess that's my point, is that a lot of maths isn't sitting down with the pen and paper and a book working stuff out. It all happens in our heads. It's all a kind of a complex process of estimation and guessing using what we know about um, maths and numbers to kind of help us make those educated guesses. But we don't just use maths in that kind of informal way. There are other uh, times where maths comes really in handy in, uh, in professions or in research topics that you might not expect. And the one I want to think about first is biology. And that's the study of living things. And in particular, one field of biology, which is ecology. Ecology is where scientists study ecosystems. What lives there? How do they relate to each other? What resources do they need and use? And how much of those resources are there out there? And how do those different organisms relate to one another and affect one another? One of the first things that we have to do if we want to study an ecosystem is understand it. What can be found there and how many of them are there? Now, if we wanted to, for example, uh, count the number of koalas in Australia, 
we've got a couple of problems. The first problem is, don't know if you've noticed, Australia's massive, right? So counting every single koala would take forever, right? Even if you had a team of a thousand scientists just walking up and down and up and down the continent, it would take way too long to count, okay? The other problem is koalas move. So if I walk down past a tree and I count that koala and then I turn around and come back and it's on another branch, is it the same koala? Like oh, maybe I missed it the first time round or, or if it's not something like a koala, what if it's a kangaroo? They can hop kilometers and kilometers every day. How do you make sure you don't count them twice? It becomes really hard. So we use this special mathematical technique called mark and recapture. And I wanna kind of show you how that works. So there's an equation that we use, a maths equation that we use, um, which I will show you. Uh, I'll show you now. Oh, oh gosh, well that looks complicated. Estimated population. Oh gosh, there's a lot of words there, and it looks pretty intimidating. But really, all this equation says is that if you have to count three things, write down what you can, and then put them in the equation and kind of do like one multiplication and one division. So it looks really complicated, but it's actually a series of simple little steps. So uh, what we're going to do is we'll um, take the equation down. I'll show you what, uh, what this looks like when a, a biologist does it. And then uh, Jackie will put the numbers that we find in. So here's my ecosystem I'm going to study. It's the bowl. And within it, I'm interested in counting these very particular organisms, the Jellius babius. And uh, in order to count the number of jelly babies in here, I could, of course, just, just pull them out and count them. It's not a very big bowl, but I'm going to show you how this mark recapture technique works. So we're going to imagine this bowl is a whole continent and these jelly babies are very mobile. So it's hard to know when you've counted them twice. The first thing we have to do is capture a certain number of them. Uh, so let's capture a number. Here we go. I've captured some. I'm going to slide my bowl over. Let's put my jelly babies down on the table one two three four five six seven jelly babies all right so that's the number of jelly babies that i captured in my first capture seven so jackie's going to write that down now we have to mark them now uh in the real world when we mark say a koala or a kangaroo we might give them a little tag around their ankle or we might microchip them uh or we might use like a dye that doesn't come off their fur um, we're going to use, in this instance, a texter. Um, uh, so I'm going to put a little stripe down the back of these jelly babies. So I'm marking them. So now I'll know if I look at a jelly baby in the future, whether it's one of the ones from our first capture, because they'll have the line. All right, so whoops, a daisy, I've dropped one. Let's pick it up. I'm going to put these back in their environment and I'm going to let them mingle with the rest of the population. Now, we might let them mingle for a month or for a year or for 10 years. It kind of depends on the organism you're studying and how desperately you want the information. So I'm going to put this bowl on top so we've got it nice and sealed up. Let's let them mingle. So we shake it up. Uh, now I'm going to open the lid, but I'm not going to look because I don't want my measurement to be biased. I don't want to pick out a jelly baby just because I can see it's got the line. So I'm not looking. I'm going to capture some again. Here we go. I've captured some and I'm going to lay them out. I've captured one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I've captured 12. Okay, so Jackie's going to write that down. The next thing, or the last thing I have to check is how many of these have the lines on? And I can tell you that one, two of them have the lines on. So uh, we'll, we'll write that number down as well. And that's all the counting we have to do. How many did we capture the first time? How many did we capture the second time? And how many of that second group had the marking? Let's put them back in the ecosystem before I eat them all. And let's bring up that equation again uh, that's got the numbers filled in. So we've got animals in first capture was seven, animals in second capture was 12, and the marked animals was two. I put those numbers in the bottom there. So I've just got to very quickly do that calculation. 12 times seven is 84. 84 
Yes, yep. 84. Divided by two is 42. So we've estimated that the population of this bowl of jelly babies is 42. So it looks pretty complicated, but it's just counting three things, multiplying two of them together and dividing. So about 42. Now, my, uh, we didn't count this beforehand, and I can tell you that there are 66 jelly babies in here. So it's not a perfect uh, answer, but it's a pretty good estimation. We got kind of close, and we would get a better idea if we did it more than once, or if we pulled out more animals in each capture. So maybe seven wasn't enough, maybe 12 wasn't enough. Uh, the more you catch, the more accurate you get. Now, knowing just how many of an animal there are is one thing, but I know that ecosystems are more complicated than just one animal. They've got lots. So we're going to do an activity together where I'm going to get you to help me estimate the population of various different kinds of organisms in an ecosystem called the pencil case. So uh, what I need you to do is grab your pencil case out and we're going to estimate um, the uh, population of some of the different organisms in your pencil case or different bits of equipment, I guess, your stationary organisms. Now we've divided all the things that we think go in pencil cases into uh, seven categories. All right, so there are pencils, there are pens, erasers, sharpeners, scissors, rulers, and other, right? So other, I know there are lots of other things that could be in pencil cases. It might depend, uh, you know, what class you're in or, or what subject you're doing, but um, those are the categories we're gonna think about. All right, Jackie, have you got your pencil case ready? I do. Excellent. Okay, so Jackie is going to do this activity along with you. So can I get everyone to please uh, close their eyes or look away, open their pencil case, and pull out one object? I got a ruler, Ben. You got a ruler. Okay, so... Uh, I'm not sure what everybody else got. Some people have got pencils or sharpeners. They might have got an other. But I can say from this sample, confidently, that 100% of the objects that Jackie found in her pencil case were rulers, and therefore 100% of the things in Jackie's pencil case are rulers. That doesn't sound right. right. No, that doesn't make any sense. See, one, I happen to think, I happen to know that a ruler-filled pencil case would be useless. Right, so that doesn't make any sense. But also I'm sure Jackie knows from experience that there are other things in there. So uh, how would we get a more accurate representation of what is in your pencil case, Jackie? Mm, well, maybe, maybe just like our koalas, we need more data points, makes right? Makes sense, makes sense. Okay, so can you put the ruler back and everyone back in your classroom, can you put uh, one uh, the object that you pulled out back in, because we want to look at our pencil case before anything's taken out. Um, now, instead of one object, let's pull out three. So close your eyes, reach in, grab three things, and pull them out onto your desk. Now, let's see what we've got. I hope those eyes are closed, Jackie. All right. What have we got now? Uh, well, I got a glue stick. Uh huh. A pen. Yep. And a sharpener. Okay, one glue stick, one pen, one sharpener. So one third of the things you pulled out were sharpeners, one third were pens, and one third were glue sticks. So now our estimation is that your pencil case is one third glue sticks, one third pens, and one third sharpeners. Now that's probably closer to the truth. Right? I mean, it shows a more wide variety of things in the pencil case, but we also know this one's not right. And we know this one's not right is because you didn't pull out any rulers. And I happen to know from the first sample, you definitely have at least one ruler in there. Yep. So the, we've got closer, but we're still not perfect. So we're gonna do one more go. And that is where we pull out loads of stuff. But instead of just loads of stuff from one pencil case, if I wanna be able to generalize about pencil cases, we're gonna use um, everyone's. So here's what we're going to do. What I want everyone to do is to pull one object out of your pencil case. So if you are um, on your own in a room, maybe you're at home, pull out one item. If you are in a class, every student needs to pull out one item. Then we're going to collect the data and we're going to collect it in two different ways. If you're doing this on your own, 
then we're going to put up a poll on the screen and you need to click the one item you pulled out and press submit. If you're doing this in a class, I'm going to need teacher's help. And that is just make a list of the totals of the things that get, um, that get pulled out and send them via the Q&A. So just like you're asking a question, but you're just reporting your results. So you can see the example there in this class, we found 13 pencils, eight pens, two erasers, three scissors, four rulers, two other. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you some time to complete this, to, to vote in the poll or to uh, report your results. Jackie's gonna write them all down and we're gonna see if that gives us a better idea. So I'm actually gonna mute and give you some time to do that without me uh, yapping in your ear about it. Uh, in this, during this time, um, if you have any questions while Ben is quiet, uh, you can also ask them through Q&A and we can answer them in the meantime. And I will now launch the poll and just another reminder that you can easily move the poll out of the way if you need to read the instructions again. Uh, now, um, I've got an anonymous question here who asks, what happens if your item you pulled out is not on the poll? Well, the good news is we've kept other, right? So other would cover literally anything else that you might find in a pencil case. So if you put out a calculator, other. If you put out a compass, other. If you put out a hair tie, other. If you pulled out a snake, other, right? If you pulled out a shoe, other, right? Um, I hope no so one has snakes in their pencil case. It could be lolly snakes. Oh yeah, I suppose. Okay. Uh, no worries, anonymous. Uh, so keep counting. We've got some good results coming in the poll. Remember, if you're doing this in a class, um, let us know with a little report that kind of lists all the things um, in the categories that are on the screen now. Someone would like to know why the jelly babies were known as jellius babyus. Um, every living thing um, that we kind of classify, we give what we call like the scientific name. And that's just because we want to be really specific, right? So, um, uh, uh, for example, I know that um, oh, I know that humans we're called Homo sapiens, and that's to make sure that we know we're talking about this particular species of human and not another one. Um, uh, ah, what do you vote for if you have a pencil with an eraser on the end? Paul, I'm going to suggest that you vote pencil, and that's because pencil with an eraser on the end is like 99% pencil and 1% eraser, and we're going to round up. But that's a great question. Um, uh, we're getting some results from St. Mary's in Bairnsdale, uh, which, by the way, I should mention is the primary school that I went to. I went to, uh, to uh, St. Mary's in Bairnsdale from prep all the way to grade five. Um, there might even be some teachers there who taught me. So I don't know who is running grade five in St. Mary's uh, Bairnsdale, but, you know, feel free to let us know in a little Q&A &A and, you know, I might know you. Um, all right. So we've got some results coming in, Jackie. Are you grabbing, getting those? Yep. Unreal. So friends, we're going to, uh, we're going to collect data for about another two minutes. So please, if you're uh, gathering up results, um, get them in uh, pretty quick. We've, we've got um, 29 uh, results in the polls. That says there's only about five groups of people doing this. Miss Langley and Miss Ryan. I don't think I know Miss Langley or Miss Ryan. Uh, I think maybe they're newer than when I was there. Um, who do I remember? Mr. Norman. I remember Mr. Norman. I think he might still be there. Uh, all right. So, uh, I'm going to look at my poll again. Yep, so we're still waiting on, I think, Mrs. Dean. I think so. I think so. Does she remember me? That's the big question, you know. Uh, Okie doke. All right, friends, one more minute. We do have to uh, move on pretty quick smart though. So if you haven't collected your results, please um, chuck those, uh, those results up. But we do have a, a pretty interesting a variety of things so far. So we will get an interesting result one way or the other. Uh, thank you, Miriam. We've got uh, two pencils, two rivers, two scissors, one sharpener from our group of seven there. What does a jellius babyus look like? Uh, 
I'm going to assume that we're being a bit silly here because jellyus babies, we all know jellyus babies are jelly babies. Um, they're just lollies, right? Um, so uh, most of them look like little people made of like jubes. All right, friends, we are going to um, gather the data we have now and use that only because we have to make sure we leave time for our other activities. So um, I am going to stop sharing the screen. Um, And uh, how are we looking, Jackie? Okay, the data is in. My goodness. Um, you know what we call this? We call this citizen science. Oh, um, yeah, that's true enough, yeah. So um, because we're gathering data from all of you, um, and you guys are kind of just citizens, um, we call this citizen science, where citizens um, report what they see, what they find, and scientists gather the data. So have a look, we've actually got, I think, a much more representative uh, sample. That means I think I'm pretty confident that this is closer to what is actually in all pencil cases than the numbers we got when we just pulled out one thing or three things. Um, now, there might be some things that make this not quite right. For example, I think scissors and rulers are a bit bigger than the other objects. So they might be the kind of thing your hand just kind of naturally grabs when you go in. Um, uh, and there's a lot of other, and because maybe because other is such a big category, um, we would expect to get lots of lots of other. But that's cool. Got some data, and uh, yeah, it gives us an idea of the sort of things that live in people's pencil cases. Great job, guys. We are going to move on though. Uh, so there is another kind of part of biology that we use maths for, um, and that's called like biometrics, which is the idea of measuring living things and using those measurements to give us an idea of how those living things kind of work or how they live. So this is Matilda. Matilda is a dinosaur that was found in Australia. Of course, we only found her fossils. Um, and uh, and uh, she's a plant eater. She's a herbivore, works around, walks around on four legs, quadruped. Um, and uh, we can use the fossils and a little bit of maths to work out exactly uh, sort of how big or how heavy she was. So to work out how heavy she was, we can actually use uh, the bones or the, the fossils that we find to estimate uh, her volume. And then all we have to do is work out something else that would be the same volume as that um, and use that to calculate how heavy she would be. So uh, we could use something like a car. Cars are pretty big. We could use something like a cow. And usually what scientists will use is another living thing, right? Because a living thing is probably made of much the same stuff as another living thing, but a car is made of vastly different stuff. So by using um, cows and we say that a cow is a certain volume and, you know, 12 cows would fit in Matilda, we can work out how heavy she is. Um, but to make that, uh, 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 and for example, guys, if we had a list of different animals we could use, then we'd have to pick which one, which one we think is the most appropriate. Um, uh, Linnell, your screen has gone black. I'm not sure why that's happened. Um, uh, I can see the screen okay. Uh, you might want to try uh, maybe leaving the meeting and coming back in. That might work. Um, this dinosaur is called Diamantus, Diamantius, no, Diamantosaurus. Gosh, it's written down somewhere. But Matilda is the nickname. It's the easier one to say anyway. So, uh, friends, if we were going to compare Matilda to another animal or use another animal as a unit, which animal do you think would be the most appropriate? Chickens, dogs, cows, hippopotamuses, elephants, or unicorns, right? Which one is going to give us the best idea of, uh, of how heavy Matilda is by comparing it? Okay, interesting. Oh, I'll leave that up for about another five seconds. Just go with your gut, friendos. Just have a guess. And we are going to end that poll. So lots of people have voted elephant, and that makes a lot of sense to me because elephants are pretty big, and so um, Matilda is pretty big also. There's that similarity there. But the people who voted chicken aren't wrong either because chickens are very closely related to dinosaurs, so maybe they're made of similar stuff. The reality is, guys, as long as you pick a living animal, it's not going to be too different. Um, you're just going to end up with a lot more chickens that fit inside Matilda than elephants, for example. Um, if we want to compare how big she is, often it's good to compare uh, how big they are to humans. And to do that, what we do is we, uh, we have to scale her 
uh, scale a human down to this picture. So we would work out how long Matilda is, and then we would work out how long this picture of her is. And that would, we would tell, we would know, for example, that the picture is like 1% the size of Matilda. Then we get a picture of a human and we'd have to shrink that down the same percentage to 1%. And that would give us a better idea of how big we are compared to Matilda. Let's have a look at another dinosaur now. This one is Australovenator. Uh, goodness gracious, Australovenator. I know this name. Oh, well, it's another one of those crazy science names, but we're gonna call him Banjo. So Banjo was found in the same place as Matilda. Um, and he is a carnivore, he eats meat. Um, now we, we did the same sort of thing to Banjo that we did to Matilda. We worked out how big he would be compared to us. Uh, and this is about how big he would be. So Banjo is actually pretty close to the kind of dinosaur that chased the, uh, the little kids around in the first Jurassic Park movie. Um, those raptors, they're pretty closely related. Um, so when I see a dinosaur like this, about the, uh, the size of a person, sort of the height of a person and a lot longer that eats meat, starts to get me worried. I mean, would that animal be able to chase me down? How fast could he run? So to do that, we're going to have to do some of this biometrics. Now, if you look at the skeleton of Banjo, this is kind of what we think he looked like when he ran. Big, long, extended leg. Let's compare that to an animal we know. Just like we did with Matilda, we compared it to, say, an elephant. Let's compare Banjo to an ostrich. Because if you look at an ostrich, it's got a very similar sort of shape when it runs. The big, long, extended leg with the kind of neck, uh, big, long neck with a head on the end. All right. So I want to know if this banjo could catch us and we'll use um, the ostrich as a kind of a stand-in for banjo. So if we compare the ostrich to us, uh, we're, the main thing we're interested in is the leg of the ostrich, right? Because the leg is responsible for how fast you run. So if we're going to compare our legs to an ostrich's legs, we need to know which bits match up to which bits. So I know where a human's hips and knees and ankles are. Have a look at those letters. Which letter do you think represents the spot where the ostrich's knee is. So I think I know where the hip is and I think I know where the ankle is, but where is the knee? A, B, C, D, or E? Which one represents the ostrich's knee? And while people are voting for that, I have put into Q&A the uh, full names of those dinosaurs. Oh, excellent. Yes, so, uh, so, Ah, uh, yes, Di Di Diamantinosaurus Matilde and Australovenator Wintonensis. I knew, I, I knew I'd read those yesterday. All right, friends, we're going to end that poll. And most people have guessed that the knee is at D. And that kind of, I can see where we get that from. It's about the same height. You know, it's, it looks like it's at about the same place. But actually, the ostrich's knee is C, right? So um, that section between E and D is actually the ostrich's foot. And the, uh, the toes are the only bit that are on the floor. Um, the knee is far, far further up. So what we're going to do in order to compare um, the kind of speed of these two animals is we're going to measure the bits of their legs and work out what we call a ratio. So I want you guys to, to help me with this. You're going to measure yourselves uh, and we're going to get a ratio. So if we move on to the next slide, we're going to, and I'm going to get my little, uh, my little texture out so as I can draw on this. So what I want you to do is to measure this distance here, B to C, from your hip to your knee. We're going to call that your femur because that's what this big bone is called. So I want you to measure your femur. Now, there's a couple of ways to do it. You could stand up straight and kind of hold a meter ruler up against yourself uh, and that might help measure you. Or if you've got some string handy, you could hold one end of the string at your hip one end of the string at the knee and kind of cut the string and then hold the string up to the ruler. So measure your femur. And then once you've measured that, I want you to measure this distance here, which is called your lower limb. Um, so the tibia, this little bit here is actually the, the bone in your calf. And the metatarsus is basically from your ankle to your toes, right? So get up on your tippy toes because that's how far, that's how we run and measure from C down to E, measure from your knee down to your toes. So you should have two numbers, the femur, which was the upper leg, and the tibia metatarsis, that lower limb, which is the lower leg. Friends, I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes to measure those. All right, now I can see that there are some people doing their measurements, but friends, we don't, 
you don't need to tell us what the measurements are. All you need to do is put those numbers in this equation at the bottom. So you can see that the ratio, which is the answer we want, and a ratio is just a way to compare one number to another number, is uh, your lower limb number divided by your femur number. So if I look at the results from St. Mary's Bansdale, they say that their first number is 30. So we would put um, 30 on the bottom. And their second number is 44. And 44 divided by 30 is about 1.5, okay? I'm gonna do this little squiggly equals. This little squiggly equals means about. So it's about 1.5. And scientists usually associate numbers that are higher than one with animals that are capable of running pretty fast. So humans are pretty fast, all things considered. We're a lot faster than a turtle. We're a lot faster than uh, like a chimpanzee can run, for example. Um, and a lot of that has to do with this high limb, lower limb to femur ratio. Okay, so uh, have a go at doing this equation yourself. Just while you're having a go, um, I'm just going to clear off all my drawings. And uh, Jackie, can you go to the next slide for me? And I want to show you the answers that we got for a few animals that we know. So the ostrich actually has a number of about four, which is pretty fast. Emus, we know are fast as well, 3.76. Kiwi birds in New Zealand, I didn't think they were that fast, but apparently they are, especially for their size, at 2.3. A red kangaroo is two and a half, although a kangaroo is a bit funny because it doesn't run, it hops. Um, banjo is about two, so we still expect it to be pretty fast. Wait a minute, a penguin. A penguin's 1.5, about the same as us. Well, that's a bit weird because I know penguins run really slow. And that's uh, because, guys, if we look at the next slide, you can see that a penguin's body, if I get my little texture out again, a penguin's body covers up a whole lot of its leg. And that means that even though it's got the right leg shape to run fast, it has to waddle because its body gets in the way a lot of the time. So these numbers, this maths we're doing, cannot tell you everything about the way an animal works. You have to have a bit of a knowledge of the animal as well, combined with the numbers. But the numbers can be a little guide to get you thinking. Oh yes, penguins do have knees, that's true. Um, but of course those knees are like up here, right? Um, and that's up inside the penguin's body uh, most of the time, so we never see them. All right, I'm going to clear my drawings because we do have one more little topic to mention before we wrap up. And I realize we're running out of time. I've been yakking the whole time. Now, friends, I know that probably um, the official session time uh, mentioned we finish at quarter two, but we will hang around until three o'clock. So if you would like to hang around for a bit more stuff, feel free. We've got a couple more activities to do and a great video to show. Um, so please hang around if you can. All right. Uh, that was an emperor penguin, Jada, an emperor penguin. Uh, which I believe is the kind of penguin from Happy Feet. Um, okay. Oh my gosh, look at this. Well, here are a whole bunch of numbers. And you might recognize some of these names. Daisy Pierce in particular is a very famous AFLW player. And that's because one of the places that we find numbers a lot these days is in sports statistics. Sports statistics um, and statistics in general is all about counting stuff. And the idea is we're looking for patterns in the counting to give us an idea of the bigger picture of how things are. So um, uh, you can see all these crazy things that get counted um, in, in sport, right? Have a look at the top there. We've got kicks, kicking efficiency, handballs, disposals, disposals efficiency, contested possessions, uncontested possessions, contested marks, uncontested marks, marks, freeze for, freeze against. Uh, hit outs, hit outs to advantage, clearances inside 50s, rebound 50s, uh, Shots at goal, goals behinds, accuracy, score assists, score involvements, tackle spoils, and marks of opposition possessions. Whoa. And that is not even all the things we count, right? They also count, you know, when they kick the ball, what foot did they use? Where were they when they kicked it? Where did the ball go after the ball was kicked? Um, was there another player near them? Were they in open space? They count all sorts of things. And the reason they count those things is because hopefully there's a pattern in the numbers we can find. That, uh, that gives us a bit more information about uh, how to change our strategy 
to win more. That's kind of what all the, those uh, sporting teams want to do, right? They want to win more. So uh, you counting to try and look for those patterns. So what we're looking for is a number that correlates with winning. And when we talk about correlating, we're saying a number that if it gets bigger, we win more, or if it gets smaller, we win more, okay? So uh, you have to be careful though, because sometimes things correlate that don't make a lot of sense. So if I show the next slide, you can see uh, this graph and you can see the purple line is how many iPhones got bought in America. And the yellow line is how many people died from falling down the stairs in America. And it looks like they correlate. It looks like when one goes up, the other one goes up. It looks like the more iPhones you buy, the more likely you are to fall down the stairs, which to me doesn't make a lot of sense. There are other phones too, right? I mean, people were falling down the stairs long before iPhones came along. Uh, so this correlation, it, it looks right, but we probably know they're not actually related, okay? So you've got to be really careful when you look for correlations that you don't just find two numbers that look right. You have to be able to understand how they would correlate. And in this case, I don't think um, one would cause the other. Uh, okay, let's go to the next slide. Here's another one. So the green line shows how much beef people in America ate in a given year. And the red one is how many people got hit by lightning and, and died. So it looks like the more beef you eat, the more likely you are to get struck by lightning and the less beef you eat, the less likely you are to get struck by lightning. Does that make any sense? Well, unless you're outside actually eating the cows in the paddock, I don't think you're gonna be more likely to get struck by lightning from eating beef. The other thing, the other way you could interpret, I suppose, is the more people die from lightning, the hungrier people get for beef. But I also think that doesn't make any sense. So you've got to be really careful because um, you can find weird things um, that, that correlate. So they have uh, people at sporting clubs whose whole job is to look at these correlations and work out which ones make sense and which ones don't. So let's, uh, let's go to the next little slide. So here's some actual numbers that got gathered by uh, two football clubs, the Adelaide Football Club and the St Kilda Football Club. And uh, these, these entries are talking about trying to get the ball near the goals. So deep entries is where the ball got close to the goal and shallow entries are where they entered a bit further away from the goal. And we can actually see how many goals and points got scored by those teams in those circumstances. So Adelaide scores a lot more goals. If I get my little texter out, a lot more goals when the ball comes in shallow. So that might help them decide where they're gonna to try to kick the ball to and where the opposition's defenders are going to try and stop them. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, actually, you know what, just chill. Uh, uh, no, we can keep that there, that's fine. Uh, so, um, it also impacts individual players. So there's a player I know called Basha Hooley, and we might find out that Basha Hooley, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, when he runs a lot, Richmond win, and when he tackles a lot, it doesn't make much of a difference. So that might make us decide that we're going to tell um, Bashir Hooli that he needs to get really fit so he can run all day, but we don't need him to lift lots of weights to get giant muscly arms to tackle people because that doesn't really help us win at all. All right, what, uh, what we do is we take those bits of information and we use them to make those decisions. And I want you guys to make a decision. Uh, so here are three players, Tom Nguyen, Lachlan Newsom, and Will Henderson. And you work for a football team and it's your job to decide which new player you're gonna try to bring to your team. And the person you need is someone to kick goals. You need a forward who's going to kick goals for your team. And you know you can either have Tom, Lachlan, or Will. So which one will you go for? So have a look here. We'll put the poll up in a minute. Um, just have a look at these numbers. Okay. We'll put the poll up. I want to know which player you would pick for your team, Tom, Lachlan, or Will, okay? Ah, it's interesting, Ben. We have uh, quite the mix of answers here. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, leave that for five, four, three, two, one. All right. So yeah, we've got a really nice mix. Uh, so you might notice that uh, 
that these numbers are all really different. So which one is the right answer? Well, the right answer is there's no right answer because different coaches or different teams will have different things they value. So Tom, for example, if I pull my little texter out again, Tom, you'll notice is a lot older and he's got more experience. So maybe that's what you want. Maybe you want a player that's kicked lots of goals and has lots of experience. But the problem with being 29 is he might only be able to play football for two or three more years. So is that worth it? Look at Lachlan, he's the opposite. He's only 19. You're probably gonna have him on your team for 10 years. But you don't really know very much about Lachlan. He's only played two games. Okay, so maybe this data is not very reliable. Maybe that's the only goal he'll ever kick. Will is a good balance, isn't he? He's played some games, but he hasn't kicked as many goals as Tom. He's nearly played, he's played more than half the games as Tom, but he hasn't kicked more than half the goals. So it's a really interesting kind of decision-making process where um, every coach and every team will have things they value and it's their decision, which numbers to value and which numbers to ignore. So whatever you picked, I'm sure you had a good reason to pick them and I hope your team does really well. Friends, um, that's the last little activity we've got uh, for this particular session. But we do have a video uh, from a, a, a gentleman named Michael, he's from America, and he works doing, uh, using science and maths and video games. Um, we thought it would be really cool to show that off too. So you're more than welcome to hang around. Um, as I say, we are going to be here until three, which is another 10 minutes or so, and the video is going to take about four of that. Uh, so um, Jackie can stop sharing the screen because I will share this, this wee video. Um, and friends, uh, if you have any questions while the video is on, please write those questions in the Q&A. Um, and that way uh, we'll be able to answer them um, while the video is on, we might type some answers. So uh, I will share the, uh, the video now. Uh, and I'll just make sure I'm sharing audio and I am. Uh, enjoy. Hello everyone, my name is Michael and I'm an evolutionary biologist. I also make video games for a living and I'm also starting to stream all kinds of science stuff on YouTube and Twitch. So here's where I'm supposed to tell you that science is awesome and you should take more science courses because it'll help you get a job and all that kind of stuff. But come on, let's be honest. I am a scientist, so of course taking science courses is important for my job. How could I be a scientist for a living if I didn't take science courses? But I do have a cool job because I get to explore questions about how males and females compete and how winning and losing affects their behaviors. I use animals like spiders and crickets to answer these sorts of questions and even study this in humans too. Humans? Yup, that's right. I explore human behavior and use video games to do that. I get people to play different video games and then see how that changes their behavior and how they think about themselves and how they talk to each other and even what kind of partner they prefer. This is actually one of the reasons I got started in creating video games because I realized that video games can be used to explore human behavior in a really cool kind of way. But this is where I'll take a break from my science stuff to focus on my well, non-science career, because understanding how science works and using scientific thinking is important for any career. And it doesn't mean you have to finish a science degree. It just means you need to understand how science works and how that can help you understand the world. To prove that, I'm going to focus on my game development career in the beginning of my currently very tiny streaming career. One of the things I do as a game developer is try and create games that are fun to play and also intuitively turn players into scientists by making them ask why. It's those why questions that are science questions and can only be answered by a scientific approach. Although I get players to ask questions about evolution or psychology, we can easily ask questions about what can improve the number of Instagram or TikTok followers I have. What kind of persona should I create to become a successful streamer? How should I contact people through email to increase my chance of selling them a product? These are all questions I ask all the time. And to figure out the answer, I have to do some research, like figure out what other streamers are doing, I have to create a hypothesis to see what may increase the number of followers I have. Like this video, for example. I'm creating this for you guys right now to tell you more about science and why it's important. My hypothesis is that by telling you and showing you that science is all about the things that you love, well, you might be more interested. Then by sharing my socials like my Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitch channels, it may increase your likelihood to check them out and follow me. 
Specifically, my prediction that showing you a persona of a scientist that isn't old and lame, but one that likes video games and values the same things that you do will make you more interested in following me. Actually, you should really check out my socials because we do really cool stuff and play video games to collect data together and talk about science. And we also play video games with other scientists. And because we live stream, you are all part of the show and can chat with us the whole time. Not bad, eh? Now that I've shown you this, I'll be watching my socials to see if my subscriber counts go up. And if they do, my predictions are right. And if they don't, I have to re-examine my hypothesis and come up with another prediction to test. So if you want to see what happens, subscribe to my Twitter, Insta, YouTube, and Twitch channels, and I'll share the results of my experiment. Now, you see what I did there? So that's how scientific thinking can help someone regardless of the career path they choose. Whether that's in biology, psychology, engineering, maths, law, business, economics, or any type of the humanities. So I'll leave it there, but I'll end with saying that we have an awesome science show happening on August 21st as part of National Science Week. The show is called Battery Low, and we're going to be playing fun video games with over 20 different scientists, and you can all join in the fun and play along in chat. It's going to be a totally rad Twitch broadcast. And remember, if you have any questions, reach out through my socials here. I'm happy to answer any of your questions about science, video games, or anything else that I can help you with. Take care, everyone. All right. I hope everybody enjoyed that video. Did you mm -hmm. like it, Ben? Yeah, it was really interesting. I never thought about how like video games over crosses over with like a STEM way of thinking. Um, so that's really cool. I mean, I play video games like, I don't know, every day, probably every day, every day. Um, and so yeah, it's really interesting to see that they, uh, they line up. So friends that are still hanging around with us, you are more than welcome for the next five minutes or so. Um, if you have a question, feel free to put it in the, uh, in the Q and A. Um, got some bad news though, and that is that all the jelliest babies have gone extinct. Um, I don't know where they went. Um, oh, really? Yeah, I've got no idea. <laughs> uh-huh. Let me tell I you, bet. though, just from a totally unrelated experiment, permanent marker ink does not taste very good. But just just totally different experiment that is in no way related to the extinction of Julius Babius. Um, so, yeah, friends, if you have a question, feel free to uh, to throw it down in the Q&A. Um, if you think of a question later, maybe you... Uh, you know, you, you're doing some reflections tomorrow because it is the end of the day, I understand that. Uh, but maybe, you know, first thing tomorrow, if you do a reflection and you, and you think, oh man, I, I really should have asked that question. You can always put it up on the physics Facebook page or send us an email um, and ask, uh, you know, oh, yesterday in the science thing, Ben said this thing and I, uh, I just want to know if it's true or, you know, some other question like that. And we love answering those questions. So please, um, please type them out, send them through on an email or up on the Facebook page and we'll be sure to, to kind of touch base and answer those questions. Um, if you did have any, if you got any feedback on the, uh, the, the session today, you should get an email that pops into your inbox in the next well, day or two. Um, feel free to fill that out and, and shoot it through. Really value that feedback as well. Um, and uh, and uh, finally, hmm, uh, if you, you, know, you have, want to share your experiences or you want to share some photos of, of kids really enjoying the session, they can go up on our Facebook page as well. We love getting that sort of stuff. Um, and just maybe. jumping on the bandwagon of asking questions, um, I know that lots of people love dinosaurs, right? Oh, yeah. And we had heaps of dinosaur questions earlier mm -hmm. today. Um, well, we actually have a dinosaur expert in our team. That's true. So, so even though Ben and I may not be able to answer very specific dino-related questions today, mm -hmm. uh, as, you, as Ben has said earlier, uh, if you shoot a question through the website, Facebook or something, um, we can actually forward that to our dino expert, Jenny, mm -hmm. and she can help answer any dinosaur related questions you may have. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, I, I, I know that I know a lot more about uh, dinosaurs now than I did before I met Jenny. So um, she's a really valuable resource. So, and she loves it when other people engage with that because that's her favorite topic. She loves knowing it's other people's favorite topic too. Uh, all right, friends. Well, look, if um, if there aren't any questions right here, right now, if, if uh, you guys can't think of anything you'd like to ask right now, that's okay. Um, but we might wrap up. We might uh, uh, finish up. So, friends, thanks so much for joining us. Um, and 
and hopefully we'll see you again next time. Yep, uh, absolutely. And uh, this project was in collaboration with Inspiring, um, Inspiring the Future. You can go check out their website if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, and thank you so much for joining us today for some Maths Made Real. Bye, right. everybody. Ciao.